This is Joe Biden looking at the mirror and looking at the Constitution, deciding I've got to make the ultimate sacrifice here for the country. But he's taking a very reckless, reckless risk, and somebody ought to look him in the eye and tell him that. Lots of news this week for the front runner in the Republican presidential primaries, Donald Trump, and also the front runner, I guess that's what we'd call him, for the Democratic nomination, President Joe Biden. So I think both parties are asking, is there a plan B? I mean, one party's asking it a little more vocally and publicly than the other, but it's definitely a conversation happening. Is there a plan B for either of these parties and either of these candidates? To pick someone's brain who's been thinking a little bit about this, our old friend Mike Murphy, fan favorite of the Call Me Back podcast. Lots of demand for Murphy. We want to check in with him on what he's been thinking about the plan B for either party. Mike, as our listeners know, worked on 26 gubernatorial and U.S. Senate races across the country, including 12 wins in blue states, something that's getting harder and harder to do. He was a top strategist for John McCain, Mitt Romney, Jeb Bush, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. In fact, you can see him in the new Arnold Schwarzenegger docuseries on Netflix. He's a political analyst for NBC and MSNBC. Mike is co-host of one of my favorite political podcasts, Hacks on Tap, which if you're not a subscriber already, I highly recommend that you become one. He also pens a political newsletter, which you can find on Substack. Just search for Mike Murphy and Substack and you'll find it. A couple recent interesting posts. And Mike's the co-director of the University of Southern California's Center for the Political Future. Mike Murphy on Plan B 2024. This is Call Me Back. And I'm pleased to welcome back to this podcast my longtime friend and a fan favorite on the Call Me Back podcast, Mike Murphy. Murphy. Hey, Dan. It's good to be here. I always call you back even when my friends and advisors say, uh, you know, this is getting a little stocky. Might be time for the restraining order. And I it's, go, no, it's no. Me. Dan's been through that before. I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to put him through that nightmare. We won't say the words Katy Perry. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's me. Great it's to be the here. listeners. It's the listeners. Well, they're, they're the my stalkers. They're the, there's like three or four people that they uh that they can't get enough of and um and you are one of them. So anyways, but really why I wanted to touch base is, um, I would say, two or three areas of panic that I hear from my friends. So I'm like a vessel for their anxiety. <laughs> That's right. That's the so old evangelical it, trick. You know, how did, I, how did I make you walk again? I'm just a vessel for the Almighty. Now, if you happen to have $200 <laughs> for the prayer fund... <laughs> Okay. So, so I'm Ernest a vessel. Angeles old scam. No, but go ahead. Fire I'm away. A vessel, I'm a vessel for my friend's anxiety. And um, and so I'm going to tell you some of the things they're anxious about. Well, there's a lot these days. So let's start with the first one. New York Times Siena poll comes out a few days ago. You and I did a podcast right before the 22 midterms where you did a kind of master class on why you shouldn't overthink or overinterpret or overworry polls, especially national polls, um, in uh, in the political campaign season. So having said that, so we kind of strenuously resist the the temptation to overinterpret polls, but we are going to kind of um, suspend that briefly here, at least to address the anxiety of, of our listeners. What did that poll tell you? I mean, the, the headline is Biden and, and Trump are tied at 43 percent, but which is which is sort of shocking, but wh wh yeah. what, what, what is everyone freaking out about in this poll? Well, I, I saw it and I thought the New York Times is sure doing its job of, of setting the national agenda uh, for everybody in politics to immediately, uh, it's an old Dennis Miller joke. Uh, it's, I know it's a bear market because I immediately run outside and crap myself. So it's, it, it, I knew all hell would, all hell would break loose. Now, let me say, my rant about national polls is about primaries. The old Milt Gordsman rule, who was a Kennedy operative, smart guy, passed away now. We used to always say, don't believe any national primary poll until after the first contest. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The general election data is more telling uh, because, one, you are testing two semi-known quantities. They know who Trump is. You know, they've tasted that dog food about 
100% of them are aware or close to. And these are registered voters. Uh, and they know Biden. He's the incumbent. So the main number you want to start looking at is, in most situations, you know, you never know when you're going to have the alien election and all the rules go out. But generally, uh, it, there's a revert to mean and a historical power to all this. You look at Biden's number, because most presidential elections are first and foremost a referendum. Or do we keep them or do we go for something new? And so Biden's sitting at 43. And then he got Trump, who's literally a barge load of political baggage, particularly among college-educated white voters. It used to be the backbone of the Republican Party. You know, there's been this weird switch of we now have blue-collar working-class voters, including Latinos, at a higher rate uh, than history would suggest. And then all the suburban, you know, college-educated voters are now doing far more Democratic in their voting. So blah, yeah, blah, way, blah. Th that is, by the way, the, the I mean, not enough attention has been paid yeah. to that. And over the last eight to 10 years, how the Republican Party has been the most multi-ethnic, multi-racial, working class political party we've seen. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, the transformation. Yeah, it turns out the answer to Jack Kemp's great dream is fascism. You know, <laughs> we didn't get that in the lab. We can thank Trump. Um, and resentments and grievance politics. But uh, so 43-43 is a tie between two products more than half the dogs have tasted and don't like. Now, there's still a lot of time. Biden has a very big microphone as president. They don't use it particularly well, but they may learn. But it points to the fundamental weakness he has as an incumbent. Why? Well, people, and remember in politics, it's not that, hey, the bond market's excited. No, no, it is what people perceive is going on in the economy. And with interest rates creeping up, maybe appropriately to smash inflation, which seems to be happening, uh, people see it in the car payment and you know the house payment and refinancing things. So there's economic anxiety out there in perception, even with the low unemployment rate, and they blame the president. And then Biden's got this special problem, which is, you know, he's 108. And it's constantly discussed. It's not something, you know, you don't put out a photo op of uh, here's Joe Biden doing his 200th push-up this morning. Uh, it doesn't really go away. So the, the problem they've got is there's a two plus two equation going on. Well, I don't think the economy is that good. By the way, most voters, even though they hate Trump, give him about a 20 plus percent advantage or even generically the Republicans who have brand problems. They give them the advantage on handling the economy. So they think Biden is so weak on the economy, they actually would rather have Trump, who they hate. So so anyway, that combines with age, which is, you know, grandpa's just not up to running the most complicated control board in the world that affects my car payment and mortgage. You know, we need something new. So Biden's only scraping 43% of the vote together. Well, why doesn't why and, doesn't why doesn't Trump suffer from the the age issue the way Biden does? Because it's you know, I think over time like and, and that's the camp. last right. No, you're you're true. This is this is like a battle royal in the courtyard of the uh, the old old people's home here. You know, it's just they're arguing about the Korean War, hitting each other with canes. Uh, the, the, um, the, the timeline is the other equation. You know, Biden, stuff can happen. You know, it's more than a year to the actual general election. Uh, and both of them have a toolbox in front of them. Now, you know, there's the other topic of, is Trump the nominee? So everybody read that poll and said, it's over. Trump's the nominee. Um, you know, my dear friend, longtime friend and podcasting partner, David Axelrod, is trying to quietly have me committed because he sees the national polls. Say, you're out of your mind. It's Trump. And when I say, well, no, you're in a confirmation bubble because you're trying to find a reason to think Biden can win because you're about, you guys are going to blow this presidential election, maybe even to Trump. That's how bad the Biden situation is. So, OK, so now let's. All right, so that's that's Biden. Now, I just want to come back to Trump for a little bit. Why, I mean, is he, on the one hand, 43% for Biden seems really weak, and for Trump, 43% seems really strong. Well, I don't know. When you get the tribal Republicans and everything together, you break 40. You know, okay. a, a, a bucket of, of horseshoes is going to get low 40s against an unpopular Democratic president. So the question is, can Biden grow to 49 or 48, and can Trump ever grow from 43? And there's a lot of junk in front of both of them. But if the economy starts to come back, if there's a signal interest rates tick down, the psychology of the economy changes, Biden has the Navy shoot down, you know, a 
a Russian drone somewhere. I mean, there are things that can happen to Biden to move it back up. The age thing doesn't go away, but the other stuff could. And they, they have a weapon, too. We, we can't uh, underestimate the court in Roe. You know, um, the American kind of voter market is conditioned to the Supreme Court on big things that penetrate popular culture, uh, saying, yes, right, you can do that, you know. This is the first time the court has been the elders and footloose and said, no dancing, nope, 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 turn off that, that crazy beat. And that has electrified a lot of younger voters, particularly younger men who are the most pro-choice group, by the way, not women. So we Republicans have decided to shove reducing perceived abortion rights into the middle of a presidential campaign, which gives the Democrats a way to say, yeah, the economy's turning. And this ought to be Biden's message. We've done the hard work. Now it's starting to finally turn rather than let me read you statistics about how great I did. But they've now got this smoke bomb where they can say, well, we're, we're, we've got a great plan in the economy. But look over there. They just arrested your sister, um, you know, for kissing a boy. So it, the Repu and the Republicans just keep diving into the wood chipper on this because all the primary incentives they think I think there's a lot of misreading going on are he's for an eight week abortion ban ha squish I'm for a six week abortion ban with armed enforcement you know drones monitoring women of ill repute you know so it, it's it, it is the usual GOP modern era suicide instinct the only guy who's not really falling for it uh, ironically is the most powerful pro choice force in the Republican Party, which is Donald Trump, who doesn't believe any of the abortion stuff, and he just adds it to the list of lies. And, you know, just to add one more layer of complexity, um, the people who are trying to beat Trump think the way to do it is evangelicals in Iowa. Now, yeah, last point, the, the primary data was like 53 Trump, negative 12, everybody else, DeSantis 17. And so we did the thing we always do, you know, we we decided we can now see the future. So all the opinions changed. If the election were held tomorrow, it's an absolute fact, and this poll verifies it, Donald Trump would be the Republican nominee. But the election is not held tomorrow. So the way the process works is Iowa, New Hampshire, and then a certain momentum. So it's Trump's nomination to lose, but if he loses Iowa, New Hampshire, he can collapse quickly. And that vote doesn't move now. In 2016, the last big open Republican primary contest, the summer frontrunner in the respected Des Moines Register poll, which is the best traditionally, yeah. anyway, media poll there, was Scott Walker coming in yeah. number second, eight points behind him, Rand Paul, the unstoppable freight train. And keep an eye on that number three candidate here in Iowa, which will do everything, the great Ben Carson. So... You know, you, you, you've you got to be careful because it's very logarithmatic there. If Donald Trump wins Iowa and New Hampshire, he's the nominee. If Donald Trump doesn't, he loses both of them, particularly to the same person, then it's better than even money. He'll implode and won't be the nominee. And so that's the argument I've been making. I, I'd like to wait to have the dog stays to dog food. In New Hampshire right now, the do Republican dogs that know Trump, because he has about 100% dogs have eaten that dog food rating, he's polling about 37 to 38%. I see a lot of the private polling, even though no candidate will admit to knowing me. I have a, you know, a fascinating cell phone bill. And so, um, you know, you got one out of three now. So there's an open market. In Iowa, it's a little better for Trump, but it's low 40s. And the other thing is everybody's polling the old caucus, which is heavily Christian. You got 170,000, excuse me, 162,000 Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents who now have nothing to do on caucus night in Iowa. And there's no armed guard at the door. You show up, sign a card, yeah, I'm a Republican, and you can vote. So, yeah, there'll be some college Republicans, you know, with a case of beer in the car, going to vote for Trump. Ha, ah, we're helping Biden. But most of it will be good government Iowans who want to put a dent on Trump. So I think the caucus electorate could be as big as 200,000 instead of the normal 170. And the Delta could be people who hate Trump and want to do the patriotic thing. So... You know, Trump's got to navigate his dirigible, enormous as it is, through a narrow mountain pass here. And then, yeah, he's the nominee. But I'm not ready to go there right now based on summer noise meter from cable TV national polling among voters who barely know there's a guy named Decalorius or something who's running against Trump and then a few people I've never heard of. OK, so Bron DeSantis in that same poll in the New York Times Siena poll is he's got a net favorable rating of uh, what is it? It's thirty one, what thirty one forty seven versus Trump's forty one fifty five. So something's happening with DeSantis. 
Yeah, um, I mean, again, noise meter effect. Every I get DeSantis cable story. Yeah, and but, he's a lousy candidate. That that so doesn't let's help. Let's spend a minute on that. So what's going on there? Because because you need an alternative. Right, right. So the press decided, and the bunch of the donor class who follow this stuff like a hawk, because they're really trying to play the futures market of who's going to be president so they can tell their friends at the cocktail party, I knew it. I, I was on that Vivek Ramachambal thing from the beginning. I could see the future. Um, you know, I've been to some of those parties. Uh, careful, don't knock over the Ming vase. You know, I went short on plastic coat hangers, and well, now I'm, that kind of insight is what I brought to the, the presidential thing. So, you know, DeSantis was the guy, because he had the easy real estate to appoint him the guy. He's got money in the bank, governor of Florida. Now, he became governor of Florida by beating two stiffs. That's the thing people forget a little bit. He didn't ever really have a hard uh, state race. You can argue because it was close. His first race against a mayor of Tallahassee ran hard left and had all kinds of problems, got jammed up later, and then was acquitted eventually. Uh, Gillum. Wow, you yeah, Gillum, Andrew Gillum. Yeah. He only won that by a point. Yeah, because he was terrible then, too. Um, it was and also then, a horrendous year for Republicans. Naturally. Right, 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 yeah. exactly. But he won. You give him yeah. points. His new name is governor. And then he beat Charlie Crist, who is kind of the Harold Stassen of Florida. Um, you know, had had a few. He's, he's kind of a wily operator, but he never had enough money to get in the race. And he was a party switcher. He had, he had some problems. So, you know, DeSantis is now... As the early front runner, big Florida guy, obviously younger, plays the Trumpian culture war stuff well. He's kind of running as a dime store version of Trump, which is, in my view, not a great strategy because how do you out Trump Trump? Uh, but anyway, he, he was appointed the front runner. He got the cable noise. He went up in the national polls, noise meter. And uh, then then it turned out that, like, you know, tries to kiss a baby. The baby pokes him in the eye, you know, smears the ice cream on his face because he's not Mr. Charisma. Now, that said... The media wanted to hate him culturally because, you know, the, the people who work hard to present impartial news are culturally much more into kale and PBS than they are into Republican primary culture. So he instantly died there. That stuff seeps through. They ran a pretty incompetent campaign out of the box. On the ground in Iowa, he's doing a little better than people are giving him credit for. At the big jamboree the other day, I had a couple old hack buddies there, and I talked to them afterward, and they say, yeah. Santos was better than Trump on his feet, got huge ovation. So I, I haven't ruled him out completely, um, but, but but Mike, he's but Mike, definitely he, on the he, downslide. He was one of the most important political leaders in, you know, 2020, 21, 2022, and, and certainly other than Donald Trump, you know, one of the most important Republican player because of what he did with COVID. And how he mm -hmm. how he led and navigated and governed during COVID, whereas the whole country seemed to be most of the country seemed to be zigging, and he zagged, and he was excoriated for his zagging, and the public authorities were you know waving you know wagging their fingers at him, and you know he was and all these all these people at the time you know at the peak of COVID you know Tony Fauci, Andrew Cuomo, Gavin Newsom, they were like gods, they were demigods, like everyone was listening to every word they say, and they were saying this guy is. You know, Ron DeSantis is like murdering people, and he stuck to his guns, more or less. And he turns out, on at least on COVID, to have been largely vindicated. He opened schools. Yeah, I, I would say semi-right, but yes. Now, you don't okay. know if it was insight or just, hey, I can be the contrarian and get the Republican whatever culture was, right Whatever it was, whatever the motivation. But yeah, he, he was the he, COVID star of the Republican Party. I mean, in September of 2020, he opened schools. Like, and he said, yeah. we're going to, that, that's like a, you know, that was not, I mean, and now in retrospect, it seems like totally logical at that time. It, he was, he was literally, you know, he was being excoriated. So I actually think he's got an extraordinary story to tell. And that obviously was like jet fuel for him. Nobody wants to talk about COVID. Nobody. Well, there's less news value in it. And he decided, you know, now that I've defeated the virus, at least in perception, I'm going to take on the shareholders of the Walt well, Disney Company. You know, and he starts throwing monkey wrenches, hunting for cultural fights. Hey, I'm going to, it turns out being a slave wasn't so bad. Three squares a day and you learned how to work an ax and a shovel, you know. we don't, They didn't even charge him for job training. You know, he goes down that, which he thinks he's he's trolling the media. But he doesn't understand that it's the old George Lakoff thing. Don't think of an elephant. 
So even though, yeah, yeah, we all hate the liberal media and the Republican Party, et cetera, et cetera, the messages still seep in. DeSantis hates people. DeSantis is a lousy candidate. DeSantis is a loser. You see, DeSantis' big kryptonite against Trump should have been, I'm a winner. I handled COVID. I beat every Democrat in Florida. I get Latino votes. I'm the future of culture war conservatism, and I'm younger than those two old fools who are running. Instead, he's gotten off on all these side battles, and the larger narrative has been lost, particularly because all the process coverage, which we're now in an epidemic of, it's all the media really wants to talk about, is about the super PACs at war, the, the, the Casey DeSantis behind the scenes, his Lady Macbeth, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it makes him look like he's going to lose. And if you're trying to tell the Republican primary voters, I'm the guy who can beat Biden, yet your campaign has big red clown shoes, it's self-defeating. So yeah, he's doing also, Dime Store New donors. Deal, and he's a loser. So, yeah, oh, the donors can hardly wait to run. Now, the problem is Tim Scott. On okay, paper, well, before we get to Tim Scott, I just yeah. I want to I mention that. So the campaign super PAC issue is interesting. So, and I get, we're, you know, here we are, you know, um, um, complaining about process analysis, but I want to do a little bit of process analysis. No, that's here. why we're here. I mean, it's our job <laughs> okay. with our 200 listeners, right? <laughs> so, so 220. 200,000, sorry. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, by the way, do you ever do the pod ranking thing? You should, because you find out your podcast is the number two podcast about American politics in Estonia or Kenya or somewhere. We do it with <laughs> Hex on Tap for Laughs, and we figure out that there are 30 people at the embassy in Romania who listen. So that All right, Alon, listen up. We got yeah, we got the we English gotta, language yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> Romanian podcast <laughs> ranking. Okay. So... Um, the DeSantis, I mean, DeSantis is running a pretty unconventional campaign structure, which is, is, you know, historically, um, most of the decision making and most of the infrastructure is at the campaign, at the candidate campaign. And then there'll be this other vehicle, the super PAC that operates quote unquote independently, that is doing the paid media and some of the digital media, and they can take unlimited donations to do that, but they can't coordinate under FEC rules under right. federal law with the campaign. And they're supposed to sort of follow publicly the campaign's lead. They can't speak privately once the once the candidate becomes a candidate, and um, and they spend this unlimited money, unlimited donations to amplify the candidate's message through paid TV. DeSantis has has kind of flipped it, where he's moved much more than a lot of the paid TV and digital to the super PAC. He's moved the ground game. He's moved this bus tour he's doing in Iowa right now. A lot of like a lot of the sort of tactical. Um, ground game infrastructure to the super PAC. So the super PAC is really the show. I mean, I guess there's there's not there's not much precedent for this. I I, I'm, I was struck that J.D. Vance, when he ran for Senate in Iowa, did a version of this too. Whereas the candidate the candidate campaign for Vance and now DeSantis is like this tiny little operation, and most of the action is over at the super PAC with Christian Kowski and Jeff Rowe. So first of all. When I, when the, when folks around DeSantis were describing this to me, I, I understood the logic of it because the candidate gets a discount on on paid media, so they want to be spending most of their money on paid media and let the super PAC kind of do everything else. Yeah, in their um, case, they like to spend it on aircraft charter, but keep going because they're FCC so, reporters. So when train I was wreck. listening to it, I was thinking, how okay, I get it, I get it in. I get the theory, but in practice, it seems like hell. No, there, there are a lot who's of ever worked on a campaign. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've run a huge super PAC. I've been yeah. I've been to this movie. Here, here's the problem: super PAC money, if you've got heat, uh, is much easier to raise than federal money because it's not limited. So, yeah, you can get thirty two hundred dollars from an individual for your individual campaign. Super PAC, you can take a hundred thousand or whatever. So, money piles up. So, of course, the campaign's like, well, how do we use all that money effectively? Well, you go to your lawyer and say, we're the super PAC. We can't coordinate. But can we rent the hall and draw and have a crowd and the candidate shows up? And, and then just for our listeners to understand, ID? when you say we can't coordinate, just because I, I want what, – what this actually means is the super PAC cannot communicate privately with the campaign and say, hey – Given the message you're pushing this week, why don't we handle the ag radio? Right. You guys do this, and on right. Thursday right. we're hitting with an ad. So the next day the press is on the the pumper nickel issue, and then that's when we pivot. Right. Yeah, yeah, you can't so do any no of that. Rules it's highly illegal. They all kind of have to operate yeah. independently. But here's the problem: the rules are murky. So what you do in the can't you go to your lawyer 
and you say, hey, can we do this? And it's like pornography. And the lawyer kind of stares at it and says, I don't know. So the, 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 it's, it's murky law and hasn't been tested much in court. So you have to decide, do you want a conservative lawyer? Do you want Sidney Powell? So last time in <laughs> 2016, Giuliani. right, right, right. The legal, legal. So last time Kasich pushed it the farthest because the candidates who are broke have the five donors back in Akron who will write a big check to the super PAC. And then they can also have a C4 committee, which is how Marco did it last time, which is undisclosed money that you can semi use for politics. Yeah, not as so, efficient. Not nearly as efficient, but you've got donors who want to give to five candidates. They like it because then nobody can know who they're right. for because they're trying to be for everybody. Um, so the DeSantis guys have thrown the old, they got Sidney Powell, and they're like, we're going to push this thing to the max. Now, I've told Jeff Rowe, uh, who's a friend of mine, that you know, you're a little too good looking to go to prison. Uh, but they're trying it. And what they're trying to do is all the Iowa field. They're throwing events that DeSantis shows up in. Um, it, it is... It, it, it is the most aggressive ever. And the problem is, some uh, what happens is a clever kid in the campaign shows up and says, hey, the deputy scheduler of DeSantis has a personal Twitter account with three followers, and I'm one of them. And I have an account with two followers, and I'm one of them. So when I put next Thursday, we're going to have a rally of a thousand people uh, in, in India, in Ola, uh, I'm publicly communicating it. You know, phony press releases. Campaigns even put out little $200 ads they make with a robot voice on Google, hoping the super PAC will see it on a YouTube channel with 10 people and then put a $2 million behind a professional version of the ad. And it's all very aggressive. And the next time and Fox— just, just for our listeners to understand, that is the way the campaign or, you know, or the super PAC basically um, passes the test of— we. All our, we all didn't our coordinate. It's public. It's, it's yeah. public. We're throwing up on Twitter now. For we put out a pack. strategy release, you know, which right. says, "Boy, if oh, our plan is next week to have a well, hell was, lot of radio." There was one. The campaign put out a memo yeah, yeah, yeah. Basi- they all do it now. Yeah, the campaign basically put out a memo, you know, saying that that we need to be advertising in the Boston market in order to to play in New Hampshire, which you know many in the press Duh. interpreted yeah. as the, the hey hey super PAC. It was like a bad signal to the super PAC. Right. But, but the, the dementia, you're totally right. So they're trying very aggressive stuff. The next political prosecution, quote unquote, which apparently has replaced cut taxes in the Republican, you know, uh, glossary is going to be when the Justice Department starts going after the Santa's campaign staff because they're running wild with this. And, you know, maybe it'll work. Uh, maybe it'll pass legal muster. I'll be shocked because these rules are going to be written by the enforcement attempts after this cycle. And the Dems do all this stuff, too. But DeSantis has set on a presidential primary campaign a much more aggressive standard. The other problem is the super PAC and the campaign apparently hate each other. Yeah. You know, normally the super PAC watches the campaign and does two things. Try to hurt the opponents with advertising, try to help the candidate, and send out little hints, but really follow the can like a hawk and try to, as you said earlier, amplify what they're saying. So if we read the campaign, oh, yeah, next week is going to be metric system week, then all right, among the key primary electorate of 3 million people in South Carolina, New Hampshire, and Iowa, let's, let's go put out $7 million of, you know, only Ron DeSantis stood up to the French metric system. So, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's still, here's what you can't do. You can't teach the candidate how to debate. If you're running the super PAC, you can't put the candidate in the ads and candidate driven ads are more effective often. Um, and, and you can't drive the schedule. So now there's all this backbiting between the two because the donors have lost faith in the campaign. There's been nutty spending in each, each of them. The press is having a field day with the FEC report and it is well known, at least by rumor, cause I've never worked for him, but in the political consultant bar room gossip, that Governor DeSantis and the, the First Lady, his wife Casey, hate consultants. So I'm sure they're sitting around thinking those idiots at the super PAC have blown all this money. And DeSantis has even publicly kind of indicated, how come I'm not seeing more TV ads about me and the metric system? So in the super PAC has got the message and said, they're morons. We're doing it our way. So it, it is yet another part of the process train wreck, along with candidate tone, that has kind of crippled DeSantis in the national narrative. But he's still selling some culture war tickets in Iowa. So we're, we're see. Everything is right now a little premature because the, the media just and, and, and large donors, everybody wants to be Kreskin and, and know the future. And it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, it just seems like the structure 
was a little too clever by half, but whatever. Way but, too clever. Yeah. Okay. So now you mentioned tips, Tim Scott before we went on, I derailed this conversation with the process analysis of a, a super PAC structure. So, so no, it wasn't. I want to talk about Tim That's Scott, it. and I want to talk about Nikki Haley. Yeah. Well, look, I, I kind of like Scott because he's the only opportunity consultant running. Uh, I don't love him. You know, the only I, opportunity candidate. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and cons- I, I didn't mean uh, consultant, I meant oh. conservative. Yeah. But yeah, and candidate. Yeah. Uh, and he knows better, and he's interesting. The problem is, he's doing a lot of what these candidates do. They're they're the king of their state, and then they go to the show, and all of a sudden it's a little more complicated. It's not like talking to the South Carolina press corps of four people, you know. And he's in a safe Republican state, so he doesn't have a lot of general election experience. Doesn't really know the national media, so he shows up. And he's like, I'm an evangelical. If I crank that all the way up, I can win Iowa. And that, you know, President Huckabee did that, President Santorum. Now, as I said earlier, Iowa might be different this time. But putting that aside, if you win Iowa, you really damage Trump. Again, my equation is Trump lose Iowa and New Hampshire. He's going to lose the nomination. If he wins them, he's a lock. So the only problem is you immediately go lose New Hampshire, which is far more secular a week later. And to kill Trump, you need the one-two punch. The worst thing that can happen is you beat Trump in Iowa, but you're so glow-in-the-dark for more secular, independent, Republican hybrid primary, which is how New Hampshire work. And again, you got a lot of board Democrats there, too, with the Biden RFK thing. No enthusiasm for Biden. Anyway, you go out and get clobbered there. I mean, Huckabee, all those guys got 10, 11, 13 points. Cruz, the Iowa winners tend to get slaughtered when they do the pure Christian deal. And then what happens? Trump gets a comeback. Trump, the biggest loser, lost to Biden, lost the House, loses everything, is now a winner. He will rock it onto the nomination. Scott is told, I, it was secondhand reported to me, Scott pitched a donor because he's doing a good job of poaching disillusioned DeSantis people. I'm going to win Iowa with the Christians, just the way you know they've done it for years. Again, might be a bad assumption. And then somebody else, quote unquote, is going to win New Hampshire and then I'll clean up in South Carolina, which is the other bad thinking. I've got a fortress, you know, in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. No, he doesn't. He's behind Haley right now, and she's barely in the race. Yeah. So, you know, if Trump, it's going to be alpha, alpha, alpha. Who beats Trump twice? That's how you kill the old lions. So Scott ought to be borrowing a page from Governor George W. Bush, which was, he, he did well in 2000 in Iowa. He won the thing by being Christian friendly with his own story, but running a much wider campaign which Scott could do. Scott's opportunity and hope thing is his advantage, mm-hmm. not a two-minute abortion ban, which is going to kill him. And then he'll be a loser after being a winner for a week, uh, and and Trump will get the nomination back. So they're they're making, in my view, a huge strategic mistake. And then finally, I, and I had written all this, I was going to post it on this Substack thing I'm playing with, because I like Scott. Some of his people are old, you know, it worked for me in the past. I like them. They're smart. He, uh, he went out and did the toady thing on the Trump indictment where mm-hmm. it's time for – and Scott's so perfectly positioned to say, look, Donald Trump has many of the right enemies. I know who they are and they're wrong. But character counts in the Republican Party. It doesn't count with Hunter Biden and the Democrats. It counts with us. And Donald Trump has failed the character test. He can't be president again. It's time to make that play because unless you out alpha Trump, you're you're toothpaste. And Scott, of course, put out the wimpy statement of, well, two justice systems, the fake one with all that evidence about subverting democracy, and then, you know, uh, the political one. And then there's the special one for Hunter Biden because on Thursday he talked to a hooker about missiles who then later had a date with the president of Belarus. You know, it's just... It, it, and so he's committing suicide. He, he's moved up in the polling. He's really close to DeSantis now in, mm-hmm. in Iowa and almost as close to New Hampshire. But he is forgetting alpha on alpha. He needs to beat Trump twice. That means the narrow plan in Iowa is not enough. It is a, a, a Pyrrhic victory at best. And you agree that the only four candidates generally that matter right now are Trump, DeSantis, Scott and Haley. Well, I'm not sure. I think third is up for grabs. I think there's Vivek Vamaranadon, and you know, Ram- Sen- Ram- yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I haven't Vivek. learned his name. Yeah, yeah, Vivek. And if I send all your angry letters to Dan Senior, I'm sorry, <laughs> I will learn his name. He could be the Swami Vivek Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy. Um, uh, that was Swami. I like the Swami angle. You know, uh, not a sinner, a Swami. I got to tell you, um, I was I was in a I was in a business meeting yesterday with someone who was like, who I, you know, you never, 
never talked politics with him before, and he's asking me about the presidential race, and and he said, you know, can you believe? I mean, I'm sort of surprised by this. Can you believe what the indictments against Trump? You know, Biden and you know his Justice Department going after his opponent for 2024. I'm sort of like taken aback. He immediately was was going down this path, and then uh, I was just listening, and I was like, well, if Trump fades, you know, who who could who would be interesting to you? And I was shocked. He says, well, you got to this guy Vivek. You know, he's really. I was like, really, I was really struck. Well. That, you know, it's it, it's time for more vowels in the White House. Oh, I'm going to get canceled. Um, you were not so, on this podcast. You are uncancelable. Yeah, that, I, I am in. I'm in a safe space yeah, here. Yeah. Well, they, look, there's always room for a sideshow candidate. Alan Keyes, Andrew Yang, Herman Cain, Andrew Yang. Yeah. Which they always have a unified field theory. They've always never held public office. Yeah. And you know, he's got enough money to. He could be a little fat. Maury Taylor. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's some room. But no, I, I think. The guy who I thought had real potential on paper and has fizzled, sadly, is Doug Burgum. Mm -hmm. Because as a self-funder, he can pay his own way to Iowa and not have to worry about donors calling up and saying, on Fox, they called you a name. You know, mm -hmm. oh, we need an emergency panic call. He, he can just launch. And his first video was great. He was doing Reagan. He's the Western yep. guy ready to lead us on, old school conservative. But then he's in the race and all, one, he, he's not prepared for the national media. You know, he, he's North Dakota. He's never had a fastball real problem uh, with them. And so he doesn't know how to set on a narrative. And all he wants to do is talk about North Dakota energy policy. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's running for deputy undersecretary of petroleum exports, uh, which is too bad. Because I think if they had stage managed it off the video right and done the common sense conservative from the West who's had it with the crap time to move on and beat Biden. He, he could have sold some tickets and he still, he spent more on TV than anybody mm -hmm. and he's creeping up there. You know, he, he's got a little motion, particularly in New Hampshire. Uh, Haley, her, she's got a lot of problems. One is she's, she's money wise. You look at cash on hand, they managed to their credit. I thought it could have been worse to put 7 million together but it's nothing like the cash power Scott has, who on campaign cash on hand on the report led everybody. Not just uh, not just ca and primary cash on hand, which is important because right, right, real money. Candidates you can play spend games by game. raising general election money from right, their fans, twice. but they can't spend it, and the top line number looks bigger than it is. So the key question in these right. primaries is to look at how, what the primary numbers are. Dollars. Right. Now, Haley will have some super PAC money. They all yeah. will. They're they're all buy TV of super PAC dollars, and that's an auction process. So they're bid the TV up where the $300 spot on Cedar Rapids Wheel of Fortune is now going to be 4000 So it's a money bonfire. But on actual hard candidate money, the best money, Scott's well-funded. Haley has one-third the dough. And I don't know what her magic trick is. You know, um, the debate is everything for her. She's got to have a star making turn there to, you know, re-energize her donors or her third quarter is going to be horrible. And she could be in the Scott Walker Museum as didn't make it to Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, January 15th next year is the big date. So it's the fourth quarter cash on hand that really counts because that's your real spending when Iowa, New Hampshire tune in and the numbers start moving. Last thing is people, you know... Uh, People who don't do this. That's when. That's when we'll have the fourth Iowa quarter. caucus night. Yeah, and Iowa, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's the peak yeah. there, and there's no early voting. It's a right, it's an right, old right, school right. thing where one day, peak at the right second. Last thing, um, when people look at a polling point, I forgot to make. When people, including half or seven eighths of the people gabbing around on cable television, repeating cliches, they look at polls. They think of a general election poll and how it moves. General elections in the typical competitive state, maybe 45% are Republican, 47 Democrat, you know, everybody else, whatever's uh, left, nine, ten, eight, nine points, that moves around. And that number is smaller than it used to be. So when you have 20% of that movable 8% changing its mind, you get a two-point movement, which is meaningful in a general election. In a primary, it's herd animals. There may be different colored spots, slight differences, but fundamentally they're all, you know, goats. Mm -hmm. So when 20% of the goats change their mind, you get a 20-point swing. Mm -hmm. And so primary numbers at the end, a 15-point swing is not a big deal. And so the, that's why primary polls are more fluid than general election polls. They're much more untethered, they're much more of a herd instinct. So that, that's why this stuff gets bumpy at the end. You look at the history of primaries, there's, you know, not always, but usually something like that in the last four weeks or so, five weeks. 
Sometimes it happens twice. The herd moves one way, eight weeks out, and then moves another way three weeks out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's the one missing equation we got to get through. And I think this Trump indictment, the conventional wisdom is every time he's indicted, he gets stronger because national polls that based on his name ID that show him winning also say, no, we're, we're, we're with our guy. We're not with the New York Times and the liberals against him with their trumped up charges. But quietly, anybody who's out there in the field, these candidates would tell you, the doubts are there. They think Biden could beat him. They think he's old. They think he's crazy. There's fatigue. So the right shiny object, and I was hoping Tim Scott could get his act together, and the time's running out. Yesterday was very bad because it was his opening. Um, uh, still could still could have a moment there. Okay. So none of them are exploiting it right, which is heartbreaking to uh, somebody like me who thinks the number one priority in politics is no Trump in the Oval. Okay, so before we wrap, we just got a couple of minutes. One question. Yeah. You wrote a your so your piece is on sub you have a Substack newsletter. I highly recommend it, the former Hacks on Tap uh newsletter. Um Yeah, just is, go. It's like Mike Murphy one yeah. or Mike Murphy nine, whatever the computer is. Yeah, just Google, assigned, but just Google Mike Murphy and Substack too. and it'll come up. Okay. So and at Murphy Mike on Twitter, I promo it there. Oh, there you go. And, and we'll put put all this in the show notes. So you have a piece up that basically Joe Biden you could say Joe Biden needs a friend. And you you argue that no one is giving him the straight talk, quote unquote. Um, that that it's in his best interest and the country's best interest for him not to run. So, isn't it obvious? What do you mean? Like, what, what do you mean he needs a friend? Well, no. I what I write about, and I use the movie The Last Hurrah, which is yeah. a great old sentimental John Ford picture about politics. That candidates by nature are consumers of friendships. You know, they want a lot of friends, and then they lean on their friends for things, and then they tend to break their hearts later. Hey, I called him twice. I can't get a call back from the senator. I knew him when he was nobody. Uh, they're in that crude business. So often the only true love they get is from long-suffering staff who've been with them forever, who they often treat kind of badly, like a toddler. To me. I'll make sure my parents love me. I'll, tr I'll act badly. Uh, so I said, Biden's got people like that where his real true, who, where he gets his real love. They've been through the ups and downs and humiliations for 30 years. They owe it to him to look him in the eye and say, this is a bad idea, this second term. Now, they're going to get a pair of Ray-Bans bounced off their heads. And they're going to get chewed out Irish politician style. But Biden needs to hear it from somebody he trusts. Because once you kill yourself through all the humiliations to get to where he has gotten, you don't want to give it up. Hey, I want to go to California. Bring that mansion with wings that I fly around in. Hey, I, you know, I, I want to right. talk to Spielberg. He's online too. You know, you're, you're, hey, I rule the world. Hey, they all laughed at me as, as pretty boy Joe who plagiarized. Well, look at me now. That's Mr. President to you. You know, it, it's, it's a thing you get in because you pay such a price to get there. But he, he, from a Democratic point of view, he's been a pretty effective president. You can argue he has more accomplishments than Obama, although that it doesn't go over so big on Hacks on Tap. Um, you can say, declare victory, man. Uh, otherwise, your reelect numbers are crap, and you have a good chance of losing. And by the way, if it was a regular election, we'd be with you, boss. We're giving it the old fight, the last hurrah. You deserve it. If you're governor of Delaware or even a normal presidency. But the threat this time is big. We have a Mussolini madman on our hands who you're so weak, even he might be able, no, I can beat him. Why take the risk? Hedge. You got a bunch of young tigers in the primary. You still have a couple of weeks and the clock is ticking where you can open it up. They can have a savage fight and somebody will rise to the top and the party will be in better shape against if it's Trump than it will be with you. That's the cold hard fact. And then again, you know, traitor and they're thrown out of the office, but somebody owes it to Biden to make that case. Because if he runs it, and loses to Trump, it destroys his legacy and it puts the country's democracy at risk. But you take someone like Governor Shapiro in Pennsylvania or Governor Whitmer in, in Michigan or Governor Newsom in California or Cory Booker, wh whomever. Aren't you surprised that one of them, both for the sake of the country and the sake of their careers, be a little entrepreneurial you know, and risk taking? I think if someone jumped in in the fall, there would suddenly be this like quiet universal sigh of relief among Democratic Party activists and donors. Because when I talk, every, every Democrat I talk to, every single one, I say, do you think it's a good idea that Biden's running for re-election? Re Not a single one says yes. Nobody, but no one will say it out loud. And I think if well, someone the, jumped uh, in and uh, said it out loud, who's not Marion Williamson and is not RFK Jr., who, by the way, are collectively polling at about 30% in the Democratic primary, I might add. Uh, if someone serious jumped in and said this, 
I, you know, this really could be a U Eugene McCarthy moment in 68. Yeah, I think you need a bigger catalyst like the Vietnam War. Um, the problem is, I, I agree that appetite's there, particularly with the, the donor smart class. And, you know, you're well acquainted with those folks, so am I. The, the problem is a president, an incumbent president, has such control over the levers and gears of the process, it is hard. You know, labor doesn't walk, and African American voters in the South, who are uh, and now in the new calendar even more powerful, they're not going to walk. You think the Vietnam War? I mean, you don't think Trump? You no, don't no think body Trump bags are coming back from the kid next door for years. Remember the um, in the '79 yeah. primary season, Jimmy Carter beat Ted Kennedy, mm -hmm. the strongest brand in the Democratic Party. Uh, now, Kennedy had flaws, but this was still in the shadow of the Jack and Bobby era. Yeah. So it, 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 when you're, it is hard to uproot an incumbent president in a primary. Th this is Joe Biden looking at the mirror and looking at the Constitution, deciding, I've got to make the ultimate sacrifice here for the country. Yeah. And I doubt he will, because I doubt he feels that way. These guys don't have small egos. I can beat them. I did before. They need me to save the country. But he's taking a very reckless, reckless risk, and somebody ought to look him in the eye and tell him that. Yeah. Okay. I know. Maybe they have. Maybe Ron Klain did it, or his sister. But they they owe it to him. That was my argument on Substack. So, I'm getting all these calls from donor friends, and they're probably listening, so they know who they are. But I won't say their names. Who are saying, you know, if you really got to take a look at this no labels, this third this third party effort to to save the country um, from Trump or Biden. Um, and the, the, given that we're heading into a world in which, you know, they're, you know, I know you disagree, but the, the conventional wisdom is that those will be the nominees. I know you disagree on the, on the Trump front, but, and you wrote a substack, very skeptical of no labels. Uh, and so tell those people listening why. So I get it. I don't want to vote for Biden. or I, I won't vote for Trump, and I'm not enthusiastic about voting for Biden, though. And I think, you know, the Democrats could do far worse. So why not load no labels? I don't get to vote for anybody I don't like, and I get a medal because I'm saving the country with the thoughtful ticket of, you know, Gandhi and, uh, and Albert Schweitzer. We're going to save the country. Well, here's the problem. In politics, it doesn't matter if your voters are happy or not. This is one of the great myths. I'll take a grumpy voter who votes for me because he hates the other candidate more. is worth as much to me arithmetically as a voter who hops and skips to the polls and can hardly wait. So what No Labels does is it gives people who hate Trump and just can't abide him but don't like Biden an escape valve to go get a halo and essentially escrow and waste their vote. Uh, that's very good net-net for Trump. Because it gives people an escape from, of course, they don't like Biden. But when forced, most people who hate both of them break three to one for Biden. And so Biden's given up his dissatisfied voters, particularly his ex-Republican, you know, college-educated, thoughtful people voters, so they can all go watch PBS and congratulate each other on what a magnificent symphony. That all makes them great. A lot of politics now is about self-expression. You know, um, and I mean, it's so easy to be a Democrat now. Well, we're not the party of destroying democracy. <laughs> we're pretty excellent. You know, it's such easy virtue signaling and no labels is a virtue signaling escape valve for for Republicans and, and conservative or more center right uh, independents who know Trump is poison, but are not happy with Biden. So this gives them a nice little waiting pool to go waste their vote in and net net help Donald Trump. And the mission here is to defeat Donald Trump first at almost any, well, in my view, at any price. No labels is a, you know, don't trust any do good organization run by fundraisers too, professional right. fundraisers. All right. Finally, before you go, I keep saying before you go, um, you, you bought an electric car, you sold out. You bought an electric car. Mark. Yeah, I got friends and you, back and then, in my and then, home. And then you've got sucked into this. You're telling me you're like, you believe now people in the EV world are like the happiest people you know. They're models well, for like it, healthy living. It lured, <laughs> well, I didn't say that. Come on, I'm not crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, it lured me into uh, Substack because I wanted to write something about an editor saying, you know, we'd really like Trump in the lead. That's how the clicks come. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Detroit motorhead. I grew up in 
I'm a car guy. I can tell you all about Holly carburetors. Yep. And I've been snorting Detroit at EVs. Guy. Detroit guy. Detroit auto guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. A lot of UAW in the family. I mean, I, 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 uh, believe me. Um, yeah. I, I'm the first Murphy in three generations that hasn't worked in a car plant. So... Though my dad, night law school, and then on to, on to a great legal career, but that's where he started. Same with my grandfather, was an elected machine pal in Detroit, uh, became an elected uh, probate judge after several attempts to pass the bar. And, you know, the machine said, all right, we got Goldberg, c c Controller Smith, we need Murphy and Cagliano for judges, you know, the old days. We have a great letter from James Farley about Roosevelt's campaign. But anyway, he was, you know, putting the Hudsons together, law school at night. So, car guy. But the tech is amazing, and I've been watching it. I'm obsessive about it. And even though I've constantly been, oh, yeah, hybrids, they run on smugness, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm driving around to L.A. with our high gas taxes and our supply yeah. issues, looking at $6, $5.50 gas. And, I, you know, cursing the house of sod every time, let alone everything else. And I, I was driving a gas-guzzling Porsche, uh, which I loved, GTS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm getting two miles to the minute. Um, uh, a gallon. So I snapped, I wouldn't buy a Tesla, even though the engineering is often quite elegant. I bought a BMW iX. I love the damn thing. Mm -hmm. It is magnificent and it makes me happy. So I of course dove into the world of charging and all that. Cause I'm inf interested in infrastructure and how we do it right. And the charging problems are very tricky to solve. And there's massive revolution. Basically Elon built a big network, which is quite good, but it's only for his car, which is one of the reasons it's quite good, easier to engineer. The other network Volkswagen built with money they had to spend on this kind of stuff out of the diesel settlement, and their network doesn't work as well because it's got to work with the Kia, Ford, GM, Mercedes, everybody. But it's getting better. And now everybody's going to go to Elon Standard. And, of course, Biden is throwing huge subsidy money at it, which is both good and bad. So blah, blah, blah. There are a million YouTube channels of these young engineers and people. And what noticed, and what I wrote the Substack about, it wasn't a big pitch for EVs. It was how happy they all are. They're finding purpose in solving really tough technical problems. You figure out how to put overnight charging at low cost into an apartment building, by the way. Figure that out, and you've solved most of the charging problem. Um, and it just struck me. It's like the Apollo program. You know, they're young, smart kids. I mean, I, I knew a very high-ranking engineer at SpaceX who I met at one of the launches. And a genius-level person, you know, is like, here, I give him a straw instantly. He's, you know, build an atom with it model. And I said, what, how does this feel? You know, a, a, a couple hours before lunch, he goes, yeah, I built this, designed this tricky thing. He goes, before this, I was at one of the big defense contractors figuring out how to, how to drop a nuclear warhead within a hundred yards of a target. And I'm glad I did it. Love my country. Defense is important, but this is a lot more fun than, you know, planning yeah. nuclear weapons. And it was the same sense there. So it, it, it just is a purpose bigger than people, than your own self-interest, as McCain would say. And I was just impressed by how a sense of mission, solving tough problems for net benefit, and in a free market way, and they're competing, all this stuff kind of coming together. I, I used to know a lot of engineers who worked in the auto companies and were kind of somewhere, but a little downbeat. Yeah, they won't approve the better lock for three years, cost cuts. But now they're all excited. We're going to build an electric, you know, Ram pickup truck, and it's going to be better than the Ford one. And the Ford, oh no, ours is just the excitement of it. Uh, that sense of purpose really impressed me. Yeah, so well, I would I'm say telling it you, sets a purpose, and it's it sets it a purpose, and it's a community. It's a yeah, community. exactly, it's, totally, totally. It's a real community, and I and I just I see this with my kids. Not to digress, but I see this with my kids, and I see so many of their peers, and the ones that seem the most lost or distraught leaving aside, you know, some have very serious, you know, or legitimate issues, you know, there's that, that young people are dealing with these days, you know, various emotional challenges or whatnot. But the ones that don't have those, you just, if you see kids who don't have a passion and don't have a community, they're the ones who, who are like, you know, the most lost and, you know, um, and totally, so, totally. We're social animals, you know, normally, right. all right, we got to build a fence to keep the bears out, you know, yeah. who's good at chopping and wood. So, and if somebody is going to trip onto the rocket fuel, bringing this to politics, I thought it might've been, by Scott, the way, this is for all the complexity it is in Israel, there to be harnessed. for all the complexity in Israel. And there's obviously a lot of tension there right now. I, I keep coming back. It's a country with a purpose and it's a country that's based on a real community. Why are people happy there? Why do people, why are they engaged? I mean, and you just see this throughout life all over the, you know, when people have a community and they have a passion that kind of 
you know, uh, undergirds or, or you, you know, unifies that community, it's extremely powerful. And you're, I feel, I felt like your piece captured the community part as much as the, as much as this kind of sense of purpose part. Um, well, thank so, you for the plug. They're free. I don't charge the monthly thing. Yeah, yeah. Thing. So uh, I will encourage our listeners to go to job. Murphy's Substack. We'll post it in the show notes, and we will let you go, Mike, because I know you've got many more important things to do than to, you know. Oh, yeah, this is yeah, always anyway. the most fun. I thoroughly enjoy it. You let me bloviate on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Race is getting interesting. Let's talk again in the fourth quarter when it starts yeah. to mean something. All right. Sounds good, Mike. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, pal. That's our show for today. To keep up with Mike, you can follow him on Twitter or X or I don't even know what to call it anymore. But in any event, at Murphy Mike, you know what I mean. And you can also subscribe to his new newsletter at Substack. Just go to Substack and search for Mike Murphy or the site is substack.com forward slash at Mike Murphy one. A couple ways to find him. Call Me Back is produced by Alon Benatar. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Senor.